Welcome, everybody. This is the Wharton School Press and its Meet the Author series. I'm Mike Yassim, Faculty Director of the Leadership Center and the McNulty Leadership Program at the Wharton School. And today I have the privilege of introducing two of our newest authors, in fact, co-authors, Erica James of the Wharton School and Lynn Perry Wooten of Simmons University. Just a word about each, Erica has served on the faculty of Emory and Tulane, the University of Virginia, before she joined our faculty as dean in uh, the middle of 2020, quite a year that was. And of course, Erica, I think many of you know, has long been involved in teaching and research on organizational behavior, crisis leadership, racial diversity, and more generally around how cultures help people thrive personally and professionally. Lynn has served on the faculty of Cornell University, University of Michigan, before becoming the president of Simmons University, also in mid-2020. And Lynn has been engaged in teaching and research on organizational development, transformation. She's focused on crisis leadership, diversity, inclusion, and organizational leadership. And I can't think of two better people to speak with us today about uh, crisis leadership and how to prepare for it, get through it, and come out on <laughs> at the far end the right way. So I'm going to uh, start with a couple of questions. You'll see a banner at the bottom with um, ways to submit your questions. And I'm going to begin with Erica and then bring Lynn in. Erica, uh, it's really interesting. You and Lynn go back to your graduate school days. So you've known each other for quite a while. But uh, thinking about the book itself, how did you come to decide to write the book together and tell us a little bit about the process of putting two heads together on, uh, here's, the, here's the full title of the book, by the way, The Prepared Leader Emerged from Any Crisis More Resilient Than Before. I think we all want that. Erica, welcome. Thank you, Mike. I'm delighted to be here and always enjoy sharing the stage with Lynn. Um, to your question about how we came to write this book, we've had a professional collaboration for more than 25 years. And as a result, we are very familiar with each other's styles and we have a similar interest in the kind of research that we do. So this is not our first time at a, uh, at a collaboration. We had written an earlier book in 2008 and, um, uh, after about a decade, we realized that it was time to update that previous book, which was also on crisis and, and leading under pressure. And we realized that so much had changed since then that it was time to update. So we connected and started writing this process in 2019, which, as you know, was pre-pandemic. We were also both going through a, a career transition where she would be starting as Simmons University president, and I was. I was to start at uh, Wharton as the dean on the same day, July 2020. And just a couple of months before we started our new roles, the pandemic came to the U.S. and we realized that we needed to kind of pivot our ideas, not to just update a previous book, but to really incorporate what the world was now experiencing uh, leading through this crisis and managing through really something that was unprecedented. Um, so we both brought our own personal experiences as crisis leaders through this, but also the 20 plus years of research that we've been doing in crisis management. Erica, thank you on that. Uh, Lynn, we'd love to get your thoughts as well. So Erica and I met in a statistics class many years ago. And since then, we have been research collaborators. And Mike, we've been asking the question, really, how do we use research and practice to make leadership better? especially as it relates to crisis leadership. And I remember the day in 2019 because I was in my car driving the back roads of Ithaca, New York, and I called Erica and said, we need to update our book. The world needs to understand what we've learned since our first book, the skill sets, how to apply it, and tell the leadership stories. So that's kind of the story. And it, it's, it's amazing to think that this was 2019, and we did not know a pandemic was coming. And so fast forward to when I first made that call in my car to Erica, we had to really rethink our model and make it relevant for contemporary times. Great. So Lynn, thank you on that. Lynn, let me stay with you then with a follow-on question, which goes to the heart of what the, the new book is all about. I'm going to quote you know, the two of you directly. 
you say we can prepare our leadership, our organizations, our systems to withstand crises, whatever they are, whenever they strike. And the obvious follow on question, and we all want to be prepared, that's pretty unequivocal, I think, in the thinking of everybody. Help us appreciate uh, at least a couple of the most important steps to do that per- preparation. Yeah. But let, let's begin with you on that one. So the premise of the book is often in business school where Erica and I spent most of our careers. We tell our students about the three P's. You have to be excellent at managing people. You have to maximize profit or organizational effectiveness. And you have to think about the planet and how you steward it. But those three P's do not operate alone. We have this concept that the fourth P is prepared leadership. And to be a prepared leader, one, you have to say crisis will happen. So understanding the phases of crisis, how do I prevent them? How do I scan my environment for them? Once a crisis hits, how do I make sure I kind of go into recovery mode and learn from them? So we have this five phase model about one, being a prepared leader is understanding the phases of crisis. But it's more than that, Mike. It really is a muscle. It's a set of competencies that are so important. And we have nine competencies, and I know we're going to talk about them later. But the basic ideal is, is that we have to realize as leaders, we're going to live in crisis. So what are the skills we need? And how do we embed those skills in our leadership practices and in our teams? And Lynn, just as a transition over to Erica on the same question, I really like the optimism that the two of you share that all of us can get more prepared. It's not something we're born with or born without. We can work hard to get those leadership capacities in place if we decide to do it. Erica, over to you on the same question. I echo what Lynn described, but I would also add that, you know, to your point about there being a muscle, that muscle only comes with practice. And we don't want to have to wait for the next crisis in order to get the next level of practice. So part of what we advocate for leaders and for their organizations is to engage in scenario planning, really going through the exercise of identifying what are the areas in which our organization is vulnerable and how would we respond if that vulnerability actually manifests into some kind of threat. So that practice, not only for the leader, but the leader's team uh, and further down into the organization, going through the exercise of un- identifying where there are vulnerabilities and you know, practicing and, and scenario planning how you would respond to any of those things. Great, Erica, practice makes more perfect. Lynn, before we move on, do you you want to get back in on that issue one more time? Yeah, you know, it, it's this notion of that you, practice comes in many forms. And we know as leaders, you learn from formal classes, you learn by doing, and you learn from your peers. And part of what we've seen in what I call this pandemic era is learning has to happen that you have to bring knowledge from history, from the past. You have to scan your organization, what your competitors are doing, what your peers are doing, what other industries are doing. And then you have to not only do kind of, you know, the after action review, but as Erica said, the scenario planning for the future. So prepared leadership is like building the bridge as you walk on it. It's constantly asking yourself as a leader, What do I need to do better to be equipped for that next crisis? What are the skills? And it's not only me, but we talk a lot about the importance of teamwork too. Um, The other thing is we talk about decision-making. It's hard in a crisis situation to be prepared for the decisions. So if you know the heuristics and the unconscious biases that you might have in a crisis situation, you'll be more effective at decision-making too. That's great. You know, just to add my own words to it, Uh, life is a classroom, our own lives are a classroom. And to strengthen that muscle, we just got to look at ourselves, look around us. It's an amazing classroom, but we learn to use it. Erica, I'm going to turn to you now for the next question on the nine skills of crisis management. And maybe you could pick out a couple of those that are really kind of top of mind at the moment, maybe from your own life and leading uh, the Wharton School part of University of Pennsylvania. And then we'll turn to Lynn. So back to the main question, the nine skills of crisis management. Give us your guidance on maybe the couple most important right now. So the way we frame the nine skills is that they are aligned with each of the five phases that Lynn just described. And there are a couple that I think are are paramount. The first one is kind of obvious because typically when you think of crisis management, when you think of crisis response, 
the first thing people go to is communication. So it is incumbent upon leaders and others in the organization to be able to communicate effectively around what the issue is that they're addressing, how the stakeholders, what stakeholders will be affected, and what the response or set of responses will be. But the communication is really, it's a necessary but insufficient part of the whole crisis leadership responsibility. So the two other areas that I tend to highlight is this notion of risk taking. When we're experiencing a crisis, our natural tendency is to become much more uh, internal and conservative and uh, narrow in our thinking and our perspective taking. And therefore, we're less creative in, in problem solving. And one of the things that we have found with prepared leaders is that they push themselves or have over time become more experienced at taking risk, even when there are threatening circumstances. And then the last skill that I would describe is this notion around being agile leaders and therefore building the capability for the organization to become an agile organization. This means pivoting when you need to pivot. It means testing and experimenting new ideas um, and, and being responsive despite all of the incoming influences that you're experiencing. Great. Thank you. Lynn. You know, um, Erica and I joke, she, her PhD is in organizational psychologists and my PhD is in corporate strategies. She likes a lot of the micro behaviors and I like the macro behaviors. And the two big macro behaviors are resiliency and organizational learning that are the competencies at the last phase of the crisis. So, so often in a crisis, we communicate, we communicate, we try to get business recovery back to normal. That's typical crisis management. But Erica and I argue that to be a crisis leader, it's beyond getting business back to normal. It really is becoming better after the crisis. It's seeing the crisis as an opportunity. And so think about resiliency. Resiliency is not only bouncing back, but it's being better. In the book, we talk about one, that yes, crises are hard. And so you have to give yourself some grace and a pause to get yourself together. And then, Mike, we go to the kind of the metaphor you said. Um, it's a classroom. You have to ask yourself, the world has changed. We are in crisis mode. What do I need to do to resolve this crisis to be resilient? And what do I need to learn? And then the third phase is embedding that learning into the organization or the system. Just a few days ago, I was looking at a newspaper and they were talking about the Michigan state government and the after action review that they did for their how they managed the pandemic in 20 and 21. It talked about things they did well, and it talked about things that they did not do well, such as mobilizing you know, vaccines to certain neighborhoods. So that after action review is important. So that resiliency. Learning also has to be in multiple modes. Um, so we spend a lot of time on individual learning, but as a crisis leader, we know that the team learning is just as important. You look at the Chilean minor crisis, um, you look at the, the magnificent, miraculous landing of the plane on the Hudson River. Those are old crises now, but they're examples of how the team learned to maneuver and succeed in those crises. And so the best teams take one plus one and make it greater than two. And so the team learning is a very big part of it, this collective learning and systems thinking. It's great. Let me stay on this topic, uh, maybe kicking back to Erica initially, then back to you, Lynn, around the word agile and the need to be very agile, to right. bring agility to, to your office every day when you come into work. And you do offer up the example in the book. You've got some fantastic uh, case accounts of people who uh, went through some of the steps that you're referencing here, including being very agile. So Erica, could you just stretch out for a, a little a little bit here, the experience of the commissioner of the NBA who managed to somehow on a dime act very agilely to take the league to the, the NBA to where it ended up as the uh, COVID-19 crisis descended on, on the world. Erica, over to you. Yes, thank you. So Adam Silver is the commissioner of the National Basketball Association. And I'll never forget being in my bedroom about to watch, and I don't remember which teams were playing, but a game. And then there was a, a pause before they started. Refs came out, there was all this commotion. And next thing you know, they're canceling the game because one of the players had been diagnosed with COVID. And this was in the obviously very, very early stages. It was unusual to me that they would make such a dramatic call. And then within a matter of days, the entire NBA season had been canceled. 
And what Lynn and I uncovered in terms of uh, Adam Silver's approach to making that decision was that they received information or solicited information from a wide source of experts to better understand what is this virus? What are the implications? Um, what does our sport and this organization, how will it contribute to the um, ongoing pandemic if, in fact, we continue with this season, knowing that we'll have thousands of people in close quarters together? What will be the implications for the health of the team? So they took all of this information into account in order to make what we would describe as a pretty uh, high risk situation or, or, or decision rather. Uh, and But they did so being very well informed and confident that they would also come up with a solution to continue with the season, which they did. And um, so we know the end of the story, it, it went as well as anyone could have possibly imagined, but it took a lot of guts for Adam Silver to make that call. It also took creativity, which is one of the competencies we talked about. I mean, think about it, Mike, before the pandemic, could we ever have imagined a basketball bubble or even full universities being online? So this creativity yeah, yeah. is something that goes along with agility. Yeah, it's great. Super. Thank you on that. Let's make it more personal for the next few minutes. And I think uh, on, on this, I'm going to, Erica, get you going at the outset. You both, as, as we've indicated at the outset, uh, took office July 1, 2020. Yeah. Rather challenging moment, to say the obvious. A moment when your own preparation was vital for getting through the months and now the couple of years ahead. And uh, Erica, beginning with you, what are one or two of the, of the leadership capabilities or crisis leadership capabilities that have proven most vital to you personally as you became Dean of the Wharton School uh, July 1, 2020? Well, just as a reminder for our listeners, when Lynn and I assumed our respective roles on July 1st of 2020, there were two crises that were underway. The first, obviously, was the pandemic, but the other was the racial reckoning and social justice movement that happened on the heels of George Floyd and, and, and others. And uh, starting in a university setting during those two times was tremendously complicated. And the expectations that various stakeholders had about how our respective institutions were going to show up in that moment was quite complex. So one of the things that I think I'll speak for Lynn on this also is one of the things that we had to do was really assess the situation very quickly. We had to learn completely new environments. We had to learn new people. We had to establish trust, not only who we could trust, but allowing people insight into who we were so that they would trust us in our organization's most vulnerable moments. So the ability to assess the situation quickly was pivotal for both of us. I would say that the other thing was really around needing to establish trust. I mentioned that earlier, not knowing who your team are, team members are, not having any history, not knowing the political and interpersonal dynamics, not knowing what the motivation was for people and why they were saying or, or advising you in certain ways, all of that really underscored the need to learn how to establish trust uh, in the people that we would be met working with throughout the um, impending months during the, the crisis. And then I would say the last thing was we each have multiple stakeholders that we are accountable to. So our students, our faculty, our alumni, the staff, the community in the, or in the surrounding area of our institutions, all of those had expectations of us. And sometimes those expectations were quite disparate. And so we needed to learn how to navigate and manage and pivot back and forth to be responsive as appropriate to various stakeholders. That's great. Lynn. You know, Mike, in the book, we use the metaphor, uh, what happens when a crisis hits and you walk in the middle of the movie? And that's what July 1st was like for Erica and I. We both took our jobs before the pandemic was known. And then we started July 1st and we had to do all those things Erica said. And we had to do a lot of the softer side, getting to know people, um, giving them hope that university life could exist in a pandemic and also industry disruption. Higher ed had never been disrupted this way. Six months before the pandemic, if you would have told most universities that they were going to have to run fully online, faculty would have laughed at that. You know that, Mike. 
And so we had to not only give hope, but build a pathway that people could see we could move forward and still great give the same great university experiences for our multiple stakeholders. Len, let me uh, stay with you uh, as an immediate follow-up on that. And looking back now over the past two years, we do learn to lead through a difficult period, partly by preparing for it, but equally by learning from going through it. So could you pick out, and then I'll turn to Erica, something that you necessarily highlight in your own mind that would be vital for your leadership on taking over Simmons University back in July 2020, uh, something that is kind of new on, on your own horizon that you didn't see coming in, but you now know to be very important for being a prepared leader. Well, you know, I, I said Erica and I met in grad school, so we're both academics, and academics tend to love to pilot solo. And so most of your career, you're rewarded for solo performance. I can say that taking over as Simmons University's president has reinforced the team, the team, the team. That prepared leadership is not a solo journey. You need the right people on your team and the right seats and not only the internal team, but it took the whole ecosystem, my alum, the community of Boston, higher education to make this thing work. So that's what I learned, the importance of multiple teams. Uh, and Lynn, before we go to Erica, let me reference an interview we completed a couple of years ago with a person who ran a huge hospital uh, and COVID hit hospitals as hard as any institutions. And she sat down with her team literally the next day and said, let's pull the team together. Uh, let, let's indeed grab this particular disaster uh, uh, by the lapels and let's get on with it. And so her team was her first her, her team consolidation and commitment was the first thing that she uh, sought. It sounds like, Lynn, this was a big piece of your experience as well. This was a big piece of both of our experiences. And Mike, remember that example you gave us, she was able to sit down with her team. Eric and I had to meet in Zoom. I had team members I didn't meet for six months after I moved to Boston because of the pandemic. So building that trust, building the prepared leaders' um, competencies over Zoom and charting a course forward. <laughs> I see you chuckling. <laughs> was yes. not something I imagined doing when I took the job in February of 2020. Exactly. Erica. So I think the thing that I take away from this experience most is people are, are familiar with the phrase, you know, with every crisis, there's an opportunity or, you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And so we assume that that happens just naturally. And one of the observations that I've had is that you actually have to be very intentional about manifesting opportunities following a crisis, in large part because people are exhausted, they're tired, they're ready for it to be over, they want to get back to what they refer to as normal, and the leader has to recognize normal will never be again. You are fundamentally changed after a threat like a pandemic or some any other kind of significant crisis. And so... In order to be resilient, in order to be better than you were in the past, uh, you have to be intentional about creating and communicating a vision of what the organization can be uh, going forward. And so our role um, is to be that vision maker and that vision communicator. So I think that was the thing that was most profound for me going through this process. Uh, that's terrific. Let's uh, open this up in just a minute. So if you have questions, uh, I think we're going to let you know once again where to send the questions. And I'm ready to uh, move them along. Uh, let me, though, before we uh, open it up completely here, Erica, let me start with you on this one. Final one for me. And that is, of all that you've learned over the last two years, what aspect of your prepared leadership now did you least anticipate coming in to the deanship that has proven to be really vital for your ability to get the job done? So what would you single out was not seen coming in, but now you know you need it? Uh, I think for me, it really was recognizing the interdependency that exists within the organization. Oftentimes people look to a single individual, a leader, the person with the highest title, as the one who will address and resolve all of the, the problems. And it's so clear that 
the leader is only as good as the people and the team that is surrounding him or her. So I feel very fortunate to have entered into an institution that has really strong people and where there was a strong culture even before I came here. So I could leverage that culture to help us navigate through really difficult circumstances. So, so culture is critical. Um, I knew that going in, but experiencing it in the context of a crisis just makes it all the more noticeable and, and valuable. Eric, let me stall with uh, you for just a second on this issue of culture. <clears throat> You preside over a very large faculty. Thousands of students are part of the school. You're part of the university. So creating a culture, sustaining a mindset is no easy task when there are so many people involved. If there's one thing that has helped you create a culture of preparedness, a culture in which we're all called upon to lead, what would you single out as the most important tactic that you have engaged in over the last couple of years well, there are two that I think go hand in hand. One is you have to be really clear about the culture that you want to create or foster. And by being clear, that means you've got to communicate it in all sorts of ways, uh, subtly, directly, indirectly, with small groups of people, with large groups of people, in writing, in, in what we have, our faculty meetings, you name it. Uh, so the more you get the message out about the kind of culture that you're trying to establish, and then showing proof points and having real examples of ways in which that culture is starting to manifest. Um, and then connected to that really is also having the right people in place to be stewards and ambassadors of that culture. So other people are also walking the walk and living in a manner that's consistent with the culture that you're trying to create. Erica, thank you on that. Lynn. So for me, um, we talk about the scale of crisis in the book and the notion that now in this world, all crises are global. And in a global crisis, you need mega community. So what I learned is it's not only my organization that has to work to wide solve in the crisis. The concept of mega communities is that nonprofit organizations, corporations, and government have to come together. And we've seen this in the last two years, the power of mega communities. And then I want to go back to something Erica has said. Um, most of my career, we've had crisis, but not at this scale. And usually we don't have the challenge of how do you balance managing and coming to recovery in a large scale crisis with thinking about the future and being visionary and strategic. So it's this balance being you're constantly juggling. People are tired with the pandemic and they can't focus on the future. And creating that vision, creating that culture, giving that hope is so important. All right, Lynn and Erica, thank you on all of the above. And now we have some really interesting questions coming in. So send your questions to us. Suzanne from LinkedIn asked the following. And I think on this one, we'll begin you, with you, Lynn. In a time of uncertainty, how do you stay agile and experiment while managing the pressures of stakeholders who want certainty and final decisions? A very good question. A very good question. Well, one, we talk about you have to have quick ethical decision-making. So being quick, using the data is so important. And then once you have that data, framing that data so that each stakeholder understands why you're making the decision, how you're making it, and what the data or information tells you. And none of us are going to get everything right. We've seen that in the last couple of years. But if you communicate those decisions and the process, and spend time building trust, you can really address that first question you had. Great. Erica? Uh, I would suggest that when you are authentic in what you're trying to achieve, and people recognize the value that, that you bring, and they recognize why, you are wanting to engage in the behaviors that you're engaging in, why you're making the decisions that you're making and how it will ultimately affect different people within the organization. Uh, I think that's really what, for me, helps to establish the need to respond uh, with finality to the here and now, but also recognize that I have responsibilities as a uh, strategic leader, which means a longer term, a longer term vision and just being clear about both of those things. All right. Thank you on, on that issue from Suzanne. I have a um, kind of a parallel question here from Rob. It's also very interesting. Here it is from Rob via LinkedIn. 
Uh, and Erica, why don't we start with you on this one? What has been the nicest surprise? It's good to talk about the good part of leadership, not, not all, not about how tough it can be at a given day of the office. So what has been the nicest surprise you have experienced in leading through these crises at your own respective institutions? And what can other le leaders look for to find the positives? Well, thank you, Rob, for asking that question. Um, one of the nicest surprise, and it surprises, and it's a reminder, I think, to all of us, is to recognize that there is talent deep within the organization. And we oftentimes have a tendency to focus and spend our time primarily with our direct reports, our leadership team, our, our senior leaders. Uh, and that's obviously important. But in a time of crisis, you will observe behavior in people that you would not have necessarily known otherwise. So going two and three and even four levels deep into the organization, connecting with people who are on the front lines of the of the threat at hand, that's where you'll find sparks of innovation and creativity that you never would have anticipated beforehand. But it's incumbent upon the leader to be intentional about expanding the information sources that they have and looking at people regardless of title, regardless of position, uh, regardless of status within the organization. Um, good ideas come from everywhere. Thanks, Lynn. You know, it's likewise, it's been those everyday leaders. I remember even when the campus was closed down, coming in and doing an ice cream party for the people who had to come to work every day and hearing how they managed the crisis, public safety, the people who were cleaning, our groundskeepers. And so that's so important. Uh, the other thing that I was surprised about is the collaboration across organizational boundaries. When I started this July um, job in July of 20, so many people, not only in the Simmons community, but in the Boston community and the higher education had the attitude, we're all in this together. We're all gonna get through this crisis together and we can develop collaborative solutions. Terrific. I have a really interesting question now from Dave via LinkedIn, and I'm going to just ask either of you to jump in as, as the spirit moves you as, as you hear the question. It's a really important question, uh, especially during a crisis, but it's true at all times as well. What's the best way to galvanize a team during a crisis? What are the crucial ingredients to getting everyone on the same page within that team? and galvanized, uh, incentivized, uh, and ready to take on the problems that abound. So who would like to take that one to get us going? You know, I'll start. Uh, crisis really already have a sense of urgency. And we know from the change management literature, one way to galvanize people is to create the sense of urgency. So that's the foundation of it. But then it does become that we can do this. It's the we can attitude, that the team can win. And having a theory of change. Everything that I'm trying to do as a crisis leader, I, I try to lay out the situation, understand it, take the data and say, this is the theory of change of how we're going to get out of it. And I need each of you. And so it's really telling the story, having the theory of change, and then letting everyone see a role that they can have. I also want to go back to what Erica said about being authentic and people seeing your human side. When we were starting the fall semester of 20, it was hard for me to shut down the campus. I had gone to a college campus every year of my life since 1984. And to have to shut down a campus and not have a convocation and be able to meet and greet students. But I told that story. I showed the human side of me. I talked about what was happening, not only at work, but my family. Erica. Yeah, I would follow on to that to say it's not only about us as leaders being human, but it's our recognizing the humanity in our teams and realizing that they have lives that aren't put on pause so that they can spend all waking hours and non-waking hours addressing the needs of the university. So um, the more people understand that you empathize and sympathize with what they're going through, the more they feel appreciated for what they're able to contribute. I think that is what really helps galvanize and uh, create a sense of loyalty within the organization by people who are who are tired, who are exhausted, who need a break. And oftentimes we can't give them what they need in totality. But if they realize that we recognize and reward and applaud and, and have gratitude for what they're contributing, I think that goes a long way. You know, a quick follow-up for me on the commentary you both offered up. 
And that is, Ben said this more explicitly just a couple of minutes ago uh, than we've heard previously in our discussion here. It's important, I think you, I think you've said, and both of you said, to personalize modestly. Don't want to get over the top in this, but with your team, with the full university, with the school, to bring your own life in in a way that illustrates what your strategy is, what you're trying to achieve, and to personalize it. So have I overstated that case, or does that sound about right? Erica, why don't you start? I think that's absolutely right. And in our case, we were living leaders trying to respond to a crisis while also writing about a crisis, while also engaging all of our research over the years on crisis management. So I think the more we were experiencing what we are trying to advise and counsel others to do, uh, the more authentic we had to be as as leaders. So I think it's absolutely critical that uh, we present our true and authentic selves in these moments. Mike, let me give you an example. Erica and I have, my youngest and her oldest are five days apart. And they both graduated from high school in 2020. So in the middle of the pandemic and could not start college in September. So we were not only experiencing it as a dean and a president, but as a parent of a child who could not go to their college campus. And we told that story often and what it meant to us. It's great. We may come back to that topic, but let me, because we're beginning to run a little short on time here, bring in, uh, in this case, uh, from LinkedIn, here's the question. In the book, you talk about the importance of learning before, during, and after a crisis. And the question is then, how do you actively pursue that personal learning? What are the tactics or steps you've each taken? Lynn, why don't we start with you and go, then go to Erica? So uh, my, maybe the L in my name is for learning. I love learning. And as you can see, I never left the college campus. But I think both Erica and I do learning in multiple forms. So there's the formal classroom, Mike, that which you hinted at. But in a crisis, you have to vicariously learn too. So I was scanning the environment, seeing how other universities were handling the crisis. I was looking at healthcare and hospitality and manufacturing. So it's constantly scanning the environment. Learning also is the personal board of directors we talked about. I had my kitchen cabinet, people that I called on weekly, fellow presidents, friends, other people in higher education. I read tons of books and newspapers. So before the day starts, I've probably read three or four newspapers and end the day with book reading. And then um, that personal learning. Sometimes I would go on college campuses and job shadow people. But as a prepared leader, you have to commit to the multiple forms of learning, the good and the bad. Sometimes I've learned from bad bosses. And I make a note of that are people who have failed in leading a crisis. Likewise, I learn from people who I think are exemplars. Erica. I don't have much more to add because we're, we're very similar in this regard. Uh, but I will say, I, I would just advise the audience that we can learn from anyone. And it's not only about the people who are more senior to us or who have been deans or presidents before, but I learn from my children all the time. I learn from colleagues who are in different, completely different industries. And I think being mindful about what you see other people doing or not doing and finding ways to relate that to your own circumstance, that is a form of learning. And, and just being really insistent upon and, and practiced in doing that regularly. Yeah, great. Erica and Lynn, I've learned from a separate discussion that you learned a lot from one another over the last couple of years. So what would be an example of uh, maybe a phone call, of one of the many phone calls I think you've shared over the last couple of years of something that one of you has learned from the other's experience? You know, I will start. Um, I am always amazed at how Erica can take something, even in the middle of a crisis, and make sure the team stays on the trajectory to pursue excellence. And that's and so I'm constantly learning how she maps out, strategizes, brings people together, and uses that organizational agility for excellence. And so I'll say, oh, what are you doing, for example, to engage new faculty in the middle of a crisis? And she'll have good examples. Erica. So for me, Lynn is an exceptional academic uh, both scholar, but also teacher. 
And she's leveraged both of those skills in being able to design uh, what a school, what a curricula, what a program should look like, whether it's a degree program, whether it's non-degree executive education. She's just so masterful at being able to pull together information and outline a course of action or a course of study that is easily second to none uh, from what I've seen. Hmm. Thank you on that. We've got a minute before I ask a final summary question here. And uh, then why don't we throw this at you to get going here on this last minute. It's a very important question. And that is, with the emphasis on learning, that takes time. How do you balance that curiosity, the natural curiosity to learn from what you're doing with the urgency, especially in a crisis, to make timely decisions? In the middle of the crisis, you're definitely prioritizing the urgency. What do I need to get done so we can go into recovery mode? And so when I'm in the middle of a crisis or I recommend for leaders, prioritize the urgency of resolving the crisis. But after the crisis is when the real learning can come, documenting what happened, the tacit and the explicit learning, and making that time. So it really is the trajectory and the continuum is how I try to do it. Erica. So I think of crises as happening along a continuum. And at the early stages, of course, your attention and your resources have to be allocated to solving the issue, putting the tourniquet on so that we can at least contain the damage of whatever's happening. But at some point, and I think we reached that point long before the crisis is officially resolved, we also have to recognize that we have responsibilities for being long-term strategic leaders as well. And I remember the day several months into my deanship at Wharton when I said to my team, I can't only focus on the the crisis at hand. I can't only focus on how we're going to deliver our education using technology and how we're going to... um, prepare our faculty and how we're going to prepare our students. I now trust that many of you are able to move forward with that work. I have to think about what the Wharton School is going to be two, five, ten years from now. So I also have to allocate some attention and resources there. And and so being clear with people about what, what and why and when you need to pivot your attention and then trusting them to do the work that they need to do allows us to really leverage uh, other people's skills and allows us to get things done in the moment, but also over time. Erica and Lynn, thank you. We're nearly out of time. And uh, before we fully thank you and close, uh, beginning, Lynn, with you, what's what's one of the most important lessons you'd like people to take away from this discussion, but also from the book with their own future leadership in turbulent times? You know, each of us with practice can be a prepared leader, and that requires learning and creativity. Great. Erica? Uh, You have to surround yourself by exceptionally talented people who are going to go through the fire with you. And that doesn't happen unless you invest in high-quality relationships beforehand. Thank you very much, Erica and Lynn. I just want to remind everybody that The Prepared Leader is available at Wharton School Press Bookstore. It's on the web. And of course, where books are sold online. To stay updated about Meet the Author, visit the Wharton School Press website and sign up for our newsletter. And of course, follow you can follow Wharton School Press and the Wharton School itself on social media. Uh, same for Lynn's uh, Simmons University, of course, uh, website there. So let me, on behalf of all the people that uh, are not visible, I'm going to raise my hands and uh, lead a collective round of applause. Erica James, Lynn Perry Wooten, thank you so much for your great guidance on being a prepared leader. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Take care, everybody.